All right. Um, hello, welcome to our very first data access and discovery webinar. Um, my name is Ruth and I'm going to be your host and chair for today. Um, and I'm just going to quickly introduce myself as not only is this our first webinar in the series, um, it's also my first time hosting an event here at HDR UK. Um, so I'm, I'm Ruth, I joined the organisation um, last month as the content and community lead for the Innovation Gateway, which is our um, digital um, search portal for data discovery and access. Um, and in the, the broader sense, my, my role here is to help um, grow and develop the community. And really what that means is getting to work across lots of different teams within HDR UK and externally to make sure that the Gateway continues to be a valuable resource for our wide community of um, users and um, partners. Okay, that's enough about me. Let's get back to today's um, event. So as I mentioned before, this is our first data access and discovery webinar. And um, we're hosting these bi-monthly. So the next one is in April. We've got details about that coming up later. And then the next one will be in June and, and so on. Um, and really the, the aim of these sessions is to cover a, a wide variety of subjects and a variety of speakers. And we hope that they're going to be um, as open and accessible as possible so that everyone can come along and learn a bit more about what we do here at HDR UK in terms of data access and discovery. Um, we also welcome any feedback that you might have. So if you have any ideas about what you think uh, would make a good upcoming session, uh, please do let us know. Again, we'll, um, there's details at the end of the webinar. Um, okay, so today's session, we are going to be looking at recommendations for um, a data use register standard. Um, and in a moment, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, um, Paula, who's going to um, kick the session off with um, some, uh, with a bit of introduction. Um, but I just have a couple of um, housekeeping items to run through first before we get into the session properly. Um, so first of all, we are recording um, this webinar. webinar. Um, there will be time for questions at the end, about 15 or 20 minutes. Um, if you have a question, please do pop it in the Q&A function um, rather than the chat. Um, and we will be finishing the um, webinar at 11.45. Um, okay, that's it from me. I'm going to hand over to um, Paula. Thank, thank you very much, Ruth. And um, good morning, everyone. My name is Paula, and I'm the Head of Alliance Strategy and Engagement at HDI UK. And today I will just introduce this session um, on data use transparency and give you a little bit of background of the work uh, around um, um, the program of work of the Alliance, a little introduction on HDI UK. And just to say that today with me, uh, we have Nada Kara, who is the project manager leading on this particular activity. And we also have two guest panelists, um, Angela Coulter, who is the, the chair of the HDI UK Public Advisory Board, and Victoria York Edwards, who's a, a research fellow at the MRC Clinical Trial Unit at uh, University College London. So just wanted to say that these three people are very key people to this work and just very big thank you to Angela and Victoria for being here today. Uh, Angela and Victoria have contributed to this work together with a lot of other members of the public and the research community and we are very grateful for um, their uh, contribution today as well and for providing their perspective. Um, so for those who don't know much about Health Data Research UK, we are the National Institute for Health Data Science, and we have a mission, which is quite a big mission, is about uniting the UK health data assets um, to improve discoveries that improve people's lives. So um, in general, we work very much with a lot of partners across the UK. Uh, yeah, next please, thank you. And we are an independent legal entity, a charity um, with, 60, with 86 organizations across more than 30 locations in the UK. And our work is really about um, delivering uh, platforms for interoperability, standards, governance, and metadata dictionary, dictionaries. The idea is really that we foster um, data science, um, leveraging current infrastructure, but also developing new infrastructure. And uh, our strategy is about uniting our data, 
improving health data and using health data. And so all of the work that we do is about partnering, partnering with a lot of organizations across the UK to make that possible. Um, so uh, here in the slide, you see uh, the UK Health Data Research Alliance, which is a network that is convened by HDR UK, but is a network of independent alliance members which are uh, leading healthcare and research organizations um, who are also data holding organizations. So the idea is that we bring together the community of data custodians who are committed to share data for research and innovation, and they want to do so um, in an ethical and trustworthy manner. So they come together to really improve the processes and drive best practice in this, in this space. We have a lot of organizations who are coming from across the UK and very uh, different from each other, but the common goal is really to make sure that um, data can be used for research in a trustworthy manner. Next, please. So I just wanted to show you this slide before handing over to Nada, who's going to talk to you about data use transparency. Uh, just to let you know that um, we are speaking today on behalf of many of the Alliance members and many of the data custodians who have contributed to this work. And this is the approach that the Alliance uses in terms of the work that we do. So the first bit is about convening the community. And so engaging patients, the public, custodians, researchers, and all of the people who are interested in a certain topic and actually get their input on what needs to be developed. And in the example that we have today, you will see um, that Nada will demonstrate that we have spoken to many of the communities that, uh, that we have um, uh, consulted. The second step is about developing standards. So it's about um, publishing or refining the standards that we propose on behalf of the community that provides input. And we have a couple of examples here around approaches to trust research environments for doing research or data standards to make sure that data can be used. And finally, the third step is about implementation of those standards. So um, while we are not an organization that implements the standards themselves, what we do is providing suggestions for custodians or other stakeholders to actually implement the standards and the best practice that Alliance members and other communities produce. And one example here is what we, uh, we are facilitating is um, we provide uh, the Innovation Gateway, which is a platform or a portal for data discovery and access, which is one example of how custodians can implement the standards that the Alliance produces. So basically, this is the work that we do and, and the, the approach that we have with Alliance standards and the work that we have done as well in this case for data use registers. But now I'd like to uh, just hand over to Nada, who's going to delve a little bit more into the work of today and how we are improving transparency uh, together with the data custodians who are contributing to this work. Over to you, Nada. Thank you, Paola, and good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Nada Kara. I'm a project manager at Health Data Research UK, and I'm going to give you a brief summary on the background on our approach to developing a data use register standard. But before I begin, uh, I wanted to just share my perspective on why I think this is a really important piece of work. So I'm probably preaching to the choir by highlighting the value in using health, the re health data research as most of you are likely to be really strong advocates of this, but there are still many people who have concerns. And I think the COVID-19 pandemic is a great demonstration of the power of using health data as it's really raised um, public awareness on the topic of data access. If it's okay, I'd like to very quickly uh, reflect on my experience during the pandemic and how that shaped my perspective on this. So I sadly lost my dad to COVID-19 back in April 2020. And although I don't really like to think about the period where he was unwell, something which does stick in my mind is the conversations that I had with some of the doctors and nurses that were looking after him during his time in hospital. And I recall calling them for daily updates. And as his condition worsened, um, I remember a conversation I had with one doctor and she said, look, we're really trying our, pet, our best, but we, we just don't know what to do. And it was that feeling of hopelessness that sticks in my mind. And if someone at that point would have said within seven months, we would have developed and have a vaccine available for everyone. It would have seemed completely unimaginable and quite frankly, just impossible. But that was the reality. And 
whilst I feel really sad that my dad didn't get to benefit from this amazing scientific endeavor, many people did get that opportunity and that chance and countless lives have been saved. Would that have been possible without access to health data? I think it's safe to say that would have taken a lot longer. With that being said, the accelerated response has raised a lot of questions and valid concerns around the type of data being accessed, the level of sensitivity, safeguards in place to protect our privacy and the interest and involvement of commercial entities. And this is precisely why we need a data use register as it provides the public with a clear record of how their data is being used, for what purpose and by whom. The challenge we face at the moment is that this information is quite hard to find and access. In the case where it is available, there's a lot of inconsistency in the form and content, as you can see from these examples here. And in some instances, it's not being made available at all. So by being fully transparent and sharing this information in a really structured and uniform way, we think data custodians have a great opportunity in improving public understanding confidence, trust, and hopefully advocacy for data use in research. And this is what we hope to achieve through developing the standards. We really just want to increase transparency in the use of health data for research. This is also something that Alliance member organizations agree to when they sign the letter of intent and join the Alliance. There are also other benefits we hope to gain from this work. So we think by better linking data uses to their outputs, we can better demonstrate the value and link of using health data. We also want to develop a culture of openness amongst data custodians, although this is a legal requirement for some data custodians, it isn't necessary for everyone. So we want to get to a point where this just becomes standard practice. We also think that this can help us provide ge generate better insights into data use. If this information is structured in the same way, we can aggregate and more easily analyze the data. So hopefully identify some gaps in some in underserved areas of research. And finally, as I mentioned, it will, it will really help build public trust and ad advocacy for data use. And this was something that was echoed by one of our public contributors, as you can see from that quote. I also just wanted to quickly highlight the public, public perspective. We really can't understate the level of public involvement necessary in this. The public really want to be involved in decisions made about data their data and this was something that we found out through feedback we received from the Health Data Research UK Public Advisory Board. The public want to be involved and they also recognise the value and need for a data use register and the, the, the ability that we'll have to really improve transparency in data access and use. And it's really important that data custodians equally recognise and prioritise this. So what have we done so far? So there's been lots of engagement, as Paola mentioned earlier on. There's been a re really widespread community involvement. We've had representatives from uh, public and uh, patient uh, advisory panels. We've had data custodians represented, researchers, policymakers, and funders. Uh, this has been around 100 people and 50 organizations that have contributed to developing this standard. Back in May 2021, we also did some research and published a preprint on the current state of uh, data use registers in, by health data custodians. We um, analysed close to 50 data custodians. We looked at the content, format and update frequency and accessibility of their registers. And the key message from this was that nearly half of the data custodians that we review do not currently publish this information, which just highlights the need for a data use register and a standard. We also were able to publish uh, a green paper, which was a first draft of our recommendations, and this went out for consultation back in July. We had a lot of great feedback. Um, the paper was downloaded over a thousand times, and the recommendations were really endorsed, with 93% of respondents supporting them. We were able then to make a few tweaks following the feedback we received, and I'm pleased to announce that we published uh, the white paper on this uh, last month in January, and we think this will be a great first step in improving transparency in data use. In alignment with this, we've also been developing a gateway data use register, um, as we wanted to demonstrate transparency of data uses for data sets made discoverable on the, the gateway. We wanted to a way of demonstrating the standard via the gateway. 
Uh, this is still underway and we will communicate more about this in due course. So what are the recommendations? So the first and most important recommendation is all about transparency. We think data custodians and controllers need to just begin sharing this information, but not only publishing it, we think it's really important that they actively promote this. The public need to know that this information exists and they need to know how to find it. The second recommendation is all about frequency. And we think for data users registers to be truly valuable, they need to be populated as close to real time as possible. We appreciate there's going to be a level of automation required to achieve this, but it's, it's a really good um, uh, target for data custodians. The third recommendation is about format, and we feel that for data use reg registers to be accessible, they need to be made available in both a human readable and machine readable format. The fourth rec recommendation is on content. And um, data use registers really need to be consistent in the information that they share. And by aligning this to the five safe framework, we think that data custodians can better demonstrate the trust trustworthiness of the data access process. The fifth recommendation is all about link to research outputs. Data use registers really provide the opportunity to close the loop on impact and make make it possible to link data uses to their research findings. We appreciate this is going to be quite an ambitious target, but where possible, we think that this will go a great way in demonstrating the benefit of, of data use. So what is the added value of these recommendations? We think that they will really help build co public confidence, reliability and trust in, in data use particularly if we can align to the five space, five space framework on, on content and in recommendation for if data custodians can de better demonstrate that access is only being granted to the right people in secure settings and for purposes that benefit the public trust, this will definitely be useful in building public confidence in the process. As I also mentioned, we also think that we'll be able to really better demonstrate the impact of research by linking to the data use this, this recommendation has been recognized as, as, as very ambitious by a lot of our contributors, but also as an essential step to really highlighting the value and impact of data use. And it, it will require system-wide effort. So just to end, um, I'd like to say a big thank you to everyone that contributed to shaping and developing this standard. Um, some of you may well be in the audience. Uh, Two of you I know are guest speakers, so thank you very much to Victoria and Angela for all your support. And on that note, um, I'll hand over to you. Hello, I think it's me next. Um, I'm uh, Angela Coulter, I chair the Public Advisory Board of HDI UK. So as you can imagine, um, we're delighted with this initiative because um, uh, the, the issue of um, uh, making uh, data use um, uh, and, and its outputs um, more transparent has been something that we've been um, particularly concerned about and, and very keen to encourage HDR UK to do more to encourage the data custodians to tell the public what they're using our data for. Um, and I just want to make three quick points about it. Firstly, um, as I'm sure all on this call recognize, um, research <coughs> uses public funds in the, in the main, um, not all of it, but public funds are, are come into almost all research. Um, and so the public has a right to know what's being done in their name, by whom and for what purpose. Uh, transparency is absolutely crucial um, and as is uh, the, the, um, the availability of clear statements of public benefit. What is this research aimed at finding out and how is it going to benefit the public? Um, now, we know that many people are very concerned about their um, privacy and particularly when it comes to personal health records. Um, so the data use registers promise um, to be um, a tool for public accountability to demonstrate um, how data is being kept secure 
um, what processes are undergone uh, when somebody re requests ask access to data and um, to demonstrate that uh, we're right uh, to trust uh, the users of the data. Um, so uh, people want to know who has accessed their data, how, and how their privacy has been protected. Um, this has been a very strong recommendation from the Public Advisory Board. So again, it's, it's wonderful to see it being progressed. But also we know, and I think the pandemic has, has underlined this, as, as Paola and Nada suggested, um, the, there is a huge public appetite to understand uh, what's being done in our name in, 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 under the heading of research and to understand the outputs. Uh, we know uh, that research for public benefit uh, can is, is important to understand. Um, and up until now, it's been seen very much as, as a kind of researcher's area. The researchers publish the, the research often in totally unreadable journals uh, that are not designed for use by the public. So um, this initiative, if it works, and I'm, I'm strongly hopeful that it will, will enable the public to see um, the, the uh, not just what's being done, but also potentially the outputs of research. And even more wonderful, if the data custodian, custodians use the gateway as the mechanism for demonstrating this, we'll be able to see it all in one place, which will be fantastic. Um, so um, what I'm hoping is that the gateway through this initiative will become the go to place for for all of us to find out what's being done. And of course, it's going to benefit um, ordinary members of the public, but I think it'll also benefit data custodians, uh, researchers, policy makers and so on, because uh, if we can find it all, at least if we can find summaries of the research all in one place, that will be a fantastic advance. So thanks very much. Okay, uh, thanks, thanks, Angela. Um, and, and Nada, actually, you've both um, gone through an awful lot of the things that I've been thinking about. Um, so hello, yes, I'm Vicky York Edwards. I'm a research fellow at the Medical Research Council's Clinical Trials Unit at University College London. I've worked in clinical trials for over 16 years, formerly in trial and data management, and now in research into methods used in conducting clinical trials. Now, I've got a particular interest in data reuse and routinely collected health data. I'm on the MRC Science Archive Data Access Committee, but also I and colleagues have used data use registers in our research. So I was extremely keen to get involved in the workshops with HDR UK to develop the data use register standard. Um, Nada's already covered much of why the use of health data in research can be so important. Um, for some time, clinical trialists have been very excited at the possibility of using routinely collected health data to make trials more efficient. And that goes for the rest of the medical community too. Um, has the potential to allow us to use data collected centrally rather than duplicating that collection by asking uh, clinical trial and uh, participants and patients and clinical staff to collect data for us. Um, using this data uh, makes it potentially easier to find out what has happened to trial participants over decades, as is often needed in cancer trials. This data can also help us to plan our clinical trials, to understand patient populations better and ensure that there are enough potentially eligible patients for a trial before it is even started so reducing research waste. In the pandemic, all of these aspects have become even more important with large scale trials only being made possible due to the use of such health data. So, I mean, that's a very brief pricey of how routinely collected health data can improve clinical trials, reduce the burden on participants and clinical staff and reduce that research waste. Similar benefits can, of course, be seen in other areas of medical research, such as observational studies. However, registers of who is accessing this data and what it's for can also be useful in themselves. Um, Angela's just talked about the benefits to the participants or, the, 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 or to patients themselves and the public. My work at UCL has actually been looking at using registers to investigate um, 
what research is going on. So we looked at how many clinical trials were accessing such health data. Um, there's been a lot of hype about the possibilities for clinical trials, but we found that between 2013 and 2018, only roughly 3% of them actually used such health data. Um, many of those 3% didn't mention using that data in their publications. So the only reason we know that it's being used is from those registers. Um, this finding is incredibly important for transparency um, and for researchers and the organizations holding that data um, who want to increase the use of that data. We need to understand why people aren't using it or when they are, why they're using it. Um, although I should of course say that since that study, the use of health data in trials has started to increase and, and that's been a trend that's very much intensified um, during the pandemic. Um, the work that I and my colleagues have done has also raised questions about the data use registers themselves, uh, many of which are reflected in the report into the current state of registers that HDR UK carried out that's mentioned in the white paper. Not all organisations could provide registers and where they did exist, they were in different formats. Um, for example, some were machine readable, others in PDF format. They provided differing levels of information were updated at different frequencies and that made it very difficult to use them in research. Um, I'm really happy about this standard. Um, I think it will provide a lot of much needed consistency and transparency. Um, if we're going to use this data in our studies, we need those whose records are held in these repositories and by these organisations, and, and that does include my own health data, to be confident in how it's being accessed, by whom, and in what it's being used for. If the public doesn't trust in the processes we use for sharing health data, it's a problem for the whole research community. These standards will hopefully provide that important information. And at the same time, they'll also help researchers to better understand the uses that this data is being put to, um, to develop collaborations and to prevent duplication of research. Um, so thank you. Thank you for asking me to come be on this panel. Thank you so much to all of our speakers, um, Paola, Nada, Victoria and Angela. Um, uh, fascinating, thank you very much. Um, so we're going to move on to the Q&A um, now. We've had uh, a few questions come in, which have very efficiently been um, answered by our panellists, some of them already, but I'm just going to read them out in case um, anyone's missed them. So, uh, one of them, um, someone was asking if we're going to, if they can get a copy of the slides. Yes, of course, we'll follow up afterwards um, and share the slides. Um, we have put a link to the data use um, paper in the chat, I believe, already, so you can access it through that. We will also share a link after the webinar as well. Um, another question. Um, does HDI UK have some open standards, metadata, data model, access, etc., that we can look at? We're building a data governance framework and would like to rely on to as many external stakeholders as possible by integrating existing standards. Um, Paula has answered that and referenced the white paper again and a summary of um, the work we've already done on setting standards. So there are um, two links, and I believe these are also shared in the chat, but do correct me if I'm wrong, Paula. Um, we have a, another question, um, what has changed in the world now the draft has been um, published? I think there's a couple of, um, Nada has answered that um, as well, but if anyone, anyone else from the um, panel would like to um, put them, please feel free, and Nada's answered we're developing an adoption plan and we're identifying early adopters in the Alliance Board. Uh, Sam, just, just to kind of expand on that, we, 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 um, we appreciate that this is going to be the most challenging aspect of, of, of this project, um, maintaining and sustaining adoption of the standard. But we feel through the work of the Alliance, we can make that happen. And um, we'll be working very closely with the Alliance member organizations to make this happen. They already agreed to this when they, uh, when they signed the letter of intent. So we feel um, that 
it, it will be possible. It may need to be phased. So we will begin with kind of organizations that are in a better position to kind of uh, meet the standard. But we will also try and provide the platform for organizations that don't have the infrastructure by developing a gateway data use register. So we hope that kind of we will make progress very soon on this. And priority. Thanks, Nada. And just to follow on that one, thank, thank you for the question, Sam. It's a very good question. Um, maybe the world has not changed yet much, but we are working towards it. And, and a couple of good examples are already that um, some of the Alliance members, even if we have published the white paper only in January, have already started to change the registers. Uh, maybe that is not public yet because they are they're, they're changing it right now but they are trying to match the standards as much as possible as they can so we are seeing some little shift coming through and we hope that the alliance um work that we're doing that is going to be a little bit more proactive on our side obviously going um to talk specifically with with the different data custodians we hope uh, one by one we'll get some of them to adopt the standards as much as possible Thank you very much, and um, hopefully that answers your question a little bit. Um, we have, um, what are the most important things the public would like to know about how data are being used? Um, yeah, I guess that may be one for me. Um, it, there have been... Uh, there's been quite a bit of research into because, of course, you can't talk with the whole public because uh, different people have different questions. But um, there has been quite a lot of research into people's concerns um, and th they want to understand um, what the findings are. Um, and that's probably going to be the most difficult bit of this whole project, but I think probably the most important one. Um, and they want to understand that. They want to see that in sort of comprehensible language. Um, some uh, researchers have started producing infographics to illustrate their findings, which I think is a fantastic way. I don't know whether the gateway will be able to incorporate infographics, but it would be terrific if it could. Um, I also want to know, um, they, as I said before, the, the security issue, the who is accessing my data, how are they getting it? How are they ensuring that it's kept secure? Um, how can I be sure that after this project has finished, the proposed project that will be published in the, in the data use register, how can I be sure that nobody else gets hold of it, that they don't pass it on to somebody else? Or, you know, so they actually have, um, many people have quite detailed and specific questions about uh, how the data are kept private. Um, and they also want to know what happens if somebody misuses my data, you know, or what happens if inadvertently perhaps my um, my, my identity is is somehow um, made public. Um, how, what kind of redress will I have? Um, and and that again, I think is 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 a really important part of of um, transparency and needs to be there too. You know, what where do, who do I go to? if I perceive a problem and uh, what will happen to them if they misuse my data. Those are just a few of the things that people have, have, have said they're keen to know. Thanks very much, uh, Angela. If anyone has anything else they want to ask, please do so now. Otherwise, I will ask the question myself, um, which picks up on a point, actually, Angela, that you mentioned in your answer is that the public want to know about the, the outcomes and the impact of um, how their data is being um, used within research. And one of those things, one of the things we need to think about is how we link all those outputs together. So I suppose this is a question to all of all of you on the panel. How how is that, you know, what does that look like um, following this work and in the future? How do we link all those elements together to create a, a a broad picture that, that the public want to receive? Well, I know that the Gateway already has um, some sort of curated collections. So you can, you know, if you're interested in COVID-19, for example, you can go into the COVID-19 collection 
Um, as far as I know, that doesn't yet have very much in the way of research outputs, but if it did, um, that would be even more useful. As it is, it's pretty useful to know who's, uh, who's using data to um, learn more about COVID-19 and what kind of data they're using. That's a great step forward, but ideally, what you'd want to find is all of that together with, with the outcomes. Yes, yeah, so this is a problem that has been exercising a lot of people for a lot of time, um, because it's not just a problem for registries where they, they, they have data, it's also a problem for funders wanting to know what's being done with their grants. And it's a, re it's a real culture change that is needed to make sure that researchers really understand the importance of feeding back all of their outputs. Um, one of the issues is that the end of their grant comes along the end of the project and often trial team um, teams, research teams um, scatter. And what we need to be is much better at a that being regarded as part of the project to feed back that information to everyone who has provided either data or, or funds um, to a project. But it's also about um, so us as organizations handing out these things out, chasing people um, and perhaps providing support to organizations, um, some of these smaller repositories to be able to do this work. Um, the great thing with the data use register is the idea of collecting um, the project by end date, because then you can sort of say, right, we've come up to an end date. We, we should contact people and ask them um, what's happened. Um, but it's also things like um, collecting um, ID numbers for researchers. So, for example, there's potentially the facility to collect ORCID numbers, and those are numbers that are associated with an individual researcher, and it connects to a, an account that has all of their publications. It can have um, research data sets, software, all sorts of things in it. And that would be a much simpler way of being able to follow through and see what outputs that specific researcher has and then being able to find what's related to your specific project. But yes, we, this is something that lots of organisations are working on and I hope it's going to start improving because we're seeing a culture change. People are now expecting that they're going to be asked about what their outputs are. It's almost like a, a sort of systemic shift in, in the behaviour yeah. has to change for, for everyone to come together. Um, there, there was also a sort of a, well, I'm finding it now, um, an additional question which relates to that is, um, who, who do you envisage being chiefly responsible to link those outputs? And I suppose actually, from your answer, it's all of us. Yeah. yeah it's a collective effort. Um, it's, it's a really tough job. Um, I'm part of, so I'm setting up a data access committee within my own department at UCL and looking at creating um, a system for this. We have long struggled with this problem of, of getting outputs from people that we share our data onwards to. Um, so I don't think it's a simple answer. As I said, ORCID can help, ORCID IDs. Um, and, and just actually having this as a specific question, having this in, in standards, it's really important because it does keep putting it in front of researchers that they're, they're going to have to do this. And obviously that will be reflected in any contracts coming um, for, for, for data um, disclosure. Almost mandated, I suppose. Yeah. Um, can, okay. I add, can I yeah. add something to this, Ruth, as well? Thank you so much, Victoria. Very, very useful to hear your experience as well in what you're trying to do as well. I think with the publication on these standards uh, now and what we're talking about today, we're talking about principles and encouraging organizations to actually follow something that is as standardized as possible. But we do appreciate that all of the organizations might be at different stages and also that the infrastructure that is behind might not support everything that we, we have listed in the standards, that absolutely we fully appreciate that. Um, one of the things that we are planning to do, for instance, with the Innovation Gateway, which is still in development, is basically trying to propose something that may be uh, uh, a platform for implementing those standards. And obviously within the Alliance, the custodians could use it in the future. Uh, um, but we are trying to, to do right what you just said, Victoria, in terms of implementing DOIs, 
for data uses, for data sets, making sure that the ORCID associated to uh, the researchers then can be linked to the data use and then to the output. And we are uh, hopefully developing a kind of system that sends notifications uh, after the, um, the end of the project, for instance, to those researchers to remind them to link to the outputs, etc. So everything is in development and is not ready, absolutely is not there yet, but we are thinking about that. And like we're thinking of this for the Innovation Gateway, I would say other organizations may think on a similar line, uh, similar um, uh, way for other infrastructures or other platforms, pl platforms such as the Innovation Gateway that may use this. So uh, I think the conversation is ongoing and a lot of people are playing uh, a role there, including the funders, the research community, universities, and the data custodians. Thank Can I just you. add one, one, one more point to that? Um, thank you, Victoria and Paula. I definitely agree that kind of automation is going to be key to this and streamlining the process is essential. But I think we need to also not think about research outputs as academic publications as mm. well. I think if, if, if the audience of this is the public, we need to communicate outputs in a way that's understandable to the public. It's very hard. For even if, if, if a publication is linked to a data use, for, for someone to understand that, the, the, the language is very scientific. So maybe as we have lay summaries, we need to think about lay outputs and, and summarizing this in a, in a way that, that everyone can understand if it is going to be of value to, to, to the public. So is there anything I want to add there? Absolutely. That's a really important point, is making it understandable for everybody. Um, I think we've probably got just about time for one more question. Um, uh, um, do you have any thoughts on what we might do with and for children when we're collecting, analysing data about them, um, as it can be different to how adults interact with data and their concerns? Um, well, I, I mean, children are just as interested um, and uh, it, it's not that difficult it's it's a spe special skill but it's still uh, not an, an an unheard of skill to write things that children can understand and indeed to illustrate them again infra infographics are fantastically useful tools i think so um th that should certainly be done absolutely um i think uh, in trials we're often working um in communities with children um and our research results to them is incredibly important and we do have researchers who specialize in in looking at that um you know we should be communicating as simply as possible about everything and that that benefits me as a researcher just as much as anyone else um you know that project where i was looking at data use registers we were using the sort of lay summaries there and Sometimes they weren't very lay and it was very difficult for us to interpret them because it's not my area of expertise. You know, I'm, I'm working from clinical trials. I'm not somebody who's working on um, pharmacokinetics or in a biological specialism. So I think everybody benefits if we put out really simple, clear messages about what research is about. Absolutely. Um, and I am going to have to end our session now because we've run out of time. Um, any questions that we haven't been able to answer either in the chat or a couple of appeared in, in um, sorry in the q and function or in the chat, we will make sure to um, answer them um, via our website um, after the webinar. Um, and just a, just an end slide for you. There's some useful links which we will also share again after this webinar in a um, with a follow up. Um, and there's some uh, keep in touch and um, upcoming events as well for your diaries, including the next data and discovery event, which is on the 14th of April. Um, I'd just like to say a big thank you to all of our um, speakers for um, talking today. Um, it's been super interesting. And for all of the questions that we've received, thank you very much for attending as well. <laughs>